Hey, toy fans and toy makers and people who like nostalgia. This is Scott Toy Guru Nightlick, and I was a brand manager at Mattel for a good chunk of the uh, DC time. Didn't work on this this DC line, uh, but I did work on a bit more of an action figure line. Well, actually, not this one either. But this is the one I'm going to be talking about today. What is this one? This is Superpowers, the Kenner line from the 1980s. Do you remember this one? You know, the one that we all saw ads for on the back of our comic books and had those amazing action features that were inspired by or, well, I don't want to say ripped off of Masters of the Universe. Did you know Masters of the Universe was the first toy line with action features? It was. But it wasn't the first DC toy line. This was the first DC toy line. A DC from Mego Corporation in the 1970s had a toy line called The World's Greatest Superheroes. And looking at it under a modern perspective, it's very odd that both Marvel and DC were shipping in the same master cartons and had cross-sells with each other. That would never really happen today. But this was really the very first DC toy line that was aimed at the masses. And it was a great toy line, especially for the 1970s. In fact, it is so fondly remembered that the Mego form factor, and you can check out my video on form factors, has been replicated by tons of different properties. In fact, during the time I was at Mattel, we even brought back DC in this form factor and did characters that never got released in the vintage line, like, uh, you know, well, Lex Luthor and Sinestro there. But that's a story for another time. Today, I want to talk about superpowers and the lasting impact and importance it had on popular culture and on toy culture, because we're all toy fans, right? That's why we're watching this channel. So there's a lot of interesting facts about superpowers. I mean, first, the fact that the figures were later re-released by another toy company, Toy Biz, under other uh, labels like the Batman line, or the fact that figures that were only released in uh, Argentina Argentina and South America, uh, such as Green Lantern as the Riddler here, uh, in an oddly painted scheme. Superpowers definitely does not have a lack of interesting stories about uh, you know the lasting impact and, and the things that were released in the vintage line. But what I really want to focus on are what really made the line great. And this was a combination of characters, playsets, and vehicles. Because this was the first time the DC Universe was brought to life in toy form. What I mean by that is it was the entire DC Universe. It wasn't just pick and choose or, you know, how Mego did some of the most recognizable characters. The Superpowers line, which had an accompanying comic book, and one by Jack Kirby, nonetheless. And did you know this was actually the first time Jack Kirby got royalties on his work? Which was pretty amazing. But the Superpowers line expanded beyond just Superman, Wonder Woman, and The Flash. And it actually included a huge array of characters that kids were exposed to for the very first time. For example... Some of the New Gods characters that Jack Kirby obviously liked to include in the comic book were included in the toy line, like Orion here. Who is this character? I mean, this is not Batman, it's Superman. For so many children in the 80s, this was the first introduction to characters in the DC Universe beyond the core, you know, Cape Crusader and Man of Steel, if you will. Yes, I mean, they had, you know, the, 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 the cartoon show, but again, the cartoon show, the challenge of the Super Friends, it wasn't like today's DC Kids shows where you see so many different characters. That show really just focused on the core characters. So it was easy for kids in the 80s to recognize characters like Batman or Robin, but the idea of knowing who Orion was, I mean, that was almost uncharted territory, and that was a huge allure of the line. For example, Dr. Fate, another one. Who in the world is Dr. Fate? I mean, we know who he is as, you know, adult toy collectors, but to a kid of the 80s who had never, you know, this character never appeared on Challenge of the Super Friends. This was just like some kind of cool guy in a blue suit and a bright yellow mask. But he was really cool looking, and you could have a toy. 
And what a toy has is what's called permanence. And this is what's really important. When you make a toy and you could hold it in your hand, it's called having permanence, meaning it, it's a 3D object that you control, that you hold in your hand. And this is a really big deal. This is what creates childhood memories and emotional connections to characters. Yes, there's something really cool about seeing Christopher Reeves flying through the air, but when you hold a Superman toy, or better yet, a character like Dr. Fate, who you'd never heard of, well, the superpowers lines, by putting all of these characters into children's hands and creating permanence, created these childhood memories and these happy, happy times associated with the DC Universe. And for a lot of kids, this was really the first major DC memory. I mean, yes, yes, again, we had our Christopher Reeve movie and we had Challenge of the Super Friends, but superpowers, by bringing the entire DC universe into toy form, not just entertainment like a cartoon or a comic book, but something you could hold in your hand, that transcended passive interaction, watching or reading, into actually active interaction. And that's what fast forwards me to my time at Mattel. So I obviously grew up in the 80s and was a big fan of superpowers. And that kind of showed in what happened at Mattel. I was very fortunate to have been partnered with this guy, Bill Benneke, who was also a huge fan of superpowers in the 80s growing up, likewise collecting the toys. So he and I, here's, here's me in my less gray-haired days when I first started at Mattel, we really embraced our love for superpowers, and you can kind of see that bleeding over into the toy line, the DC Universe Classics. In fact, so much that we actually recreated every figure that was released in superpowers in DC Universe Classics 6-inch line. And this was very deliberate. This wasn't like an accident that just happened. This was something that we were kind of doing from day one when we first signed that master license. So... As an example, Green Arrow here, we very, very deliberately wanted to do an updated version of the Superpowers Green Lantern. I'm uh, sorry, Green Arrow. Uh, Freudian slip when you say one thing and mean your mother. So Green Arrow down to the G on his belt, to the colors, to the gauntlets. This was all done deliberately because we had a long-time goal that we hoped to get to all of the Superpowers figures in DC Universe Classics. And because we grew up with the Superpowers figures, because we had that interactive experience, it wasn't just a passive experience of playing with these figures, with the play sets, with the vehicles, of snapping their accessories in hands and activating their action features, you know, discovering characters like Dr. Fate. You know, this was the very first time I ever heard of Dr. Fate, was getting this action figure. Before then, I had no idea this character even existed. And to me, that's really what makes superpowers such an important part of toy history. Yes, Mego came first, and Mego introduced a lot of kids to more interactive play with DC characters. But superpowers did it sort of one up by, by really expanding the character selection. And again, you can see, like with Doctor Fate, we deliberately did not, we did the modern version, but we also did the superpowers version. And that was very much on purpose, very much thought through. And that also explains why some of the odd figures showed up in TCU Classics. Because we did want to do all of those characters, including some of those characters that were invented for the line. And that's why you definitely saw some odd choices, but it was because we were paying homage to superpowers and we really wanted to be able to complete the superpowers lineup. In fact, the final release, or one of the final waves, at least that I got to work on, was literally taking the figures and putting them on superpowers cards. It gave us an opportunity to correct a few things, such as Wonder Woman giving her a more accurate superpowers deco with yellow instead of gold. But, you know, we already had the tool for Wonder Woman, so it made it easy. We were just able to do her as a repaint. But to me, this was really the last stretch, was getting all of those characters in their true superpowers colors. Now, we didn't, you know, fully 
you know, I, I'm not saying we did it perfectly. I mean, there were a few issues. But we did some odd ones, too. Like, you know, we did the gold Superman, who never made it into superpowers, but was planned for the final wave. Um, that was kind of sort of a, you know, that extra tribute. And of course, and this is absolutely one of my favorite toys I ever got to work on, was doing Green Lantern as the Riddler. And we even released him on an all-Spanish card to pay homage to how he was only originally released in Argentina. And yeah, I mean, this, this, was, this is an amazing figure that I absolutely adore. And you can even see the ring is on the Riddler's finger there because it's just Hal Jordan, Green Lantern, painted as the Riddler, even with the off-colored green on the arms and the legs. The attention to detail, honestly, that went to this figure is just amazing. And I'm, in fact, this is one of the only carded DC figures I have in my office. Another example of where we really tried to close the loop was doing Mr. Freeze. So we didn't have the tooling budget to tool up a brand new Mr. Freeze for the end of the line for superpowers, but we knew we had kind of, call it close enough, we had a Mr. Freeze tool that had been released in the Batman line previous to the Master Toy License being signed, where we got access to all the characters. Back then we just had the Batman and Superman families. So this Mr. Freeze had actually already been released in a few decos, and what we did is we redecoed him in Superpowers colors. You know, yeah, well, I mean, maybe we could have done a completely new tool to make him fully Superpowers, but I think this one was pretty good. I mean, it, it once we looked at how the deco looked, we all felt good about it. I think the only one that really bugged me to this day was Superman. That the blue just wasn't quite the blue that I hoped it would be. It just came out a little darker than the prototype. But, you know, that's sometimes what happens. But it definitely reminds me of the Superpowers figure. I mean, he didn't have light blue either. And getting to pair him with Lex Luthor, something I did as a kid, and the fact that we can do that now as adult collectors, to me, that's what toy collecting is all about. And that's why Superpowers was such a great line. It inspired kids and toy makers to make product based on it. it. It just had such a lasting effect. If you like this video and want to see more nostalgia videos and inside looks into the toy industry, be sure to subscribe. I'll keep pumping them out as long as you guys keep subscribing.